welcome to Das German Critic. Well, hey, außer mir macht's ja keiner. And let me start off by answering one question. No, I have not read the book. I am not going to talk about the differences between the movie and the book. This review is not of the book. So, with that said, let's talk a little backstory on today's film. The year is 1983. Not only the year Stern magazine publishers made complete twats of themselves, but also the same year the German Green Party entered Parliament for the first time in its history. This set off a kind of revival with regards to ecological awareness, and with it, a slew of related media. This is where Die Wolke, The Cloud, comes in. Written in 1987 by young adult author Gudrun Pausewang, the book tells the story of a young girl after an accident in a nearby nuclear power plant. Hey, I never ever said I wasn't going to talk about the book. I just said it wasn't going to be the subject of this review. So, with that said, go find the nearest bunker or duck and cover as we take a look at the film adaptation of Die Wolke, The Cloud. The film opens up with some audio from the plant, foreshadowing what is about to happen in this film. We then follow our main protagonist, Hannah, played by Paula Kallenberg, through several episodes of her life, hanging out at the lake with her best friend, humiliating herself in class by not knowing what photosynthesis is, and being asked to pick up her little brother from school by her mom. Which is kind of a weird topic. I mean, why photosynthesis? Wouldn't it make much more sense to talk about something like nuclear fusion? In a scene in the school library, we then find out that Hannah has the hots for her classmate Elmar, played by Franz Dinder. Of course, her BFF Maike, played by Jennifer Ulrich, soon finds out about this and suggests she and Hannah go to Elmer's house under the guise of wanting to study with him for an upcoming exam so that Hannah and he can have some alone time. Cut to Elmer coming home and we get a bit of character development. We find out that his parents are very rich but evidently have more money than time for their son. Something that is evident by the fact that instead of spending some time with him or giving him, well, you know, actual presents, they instead give him money. Hannah and Micah go to Elmer's house, and Hannah and Elmer do indeed share a sort of moment with each other. However, then three people from their class that Micah may or may not have invited crash the get-together. Elmer gets into a fight with one of them. Inconveniently, at the same time, his parents come home. Oops. Well, at least Elmer tries to make up for that. How, you may ask? By having him and Hannah fake having to go to the bathroom in the middle of their exam so the two can make out. Because... Kinky? However, their private biology exam is cut short when Elmer hears a warning siren and immediately recognizes the signal for what it is. Naturally, the teacher doesn't believe him and asks him to take a seat and finish the exam. It turns out that Elmer was right though, as through the speakers, everyone is informed that this is, in fact, not a drill, and then all hell breaks loose at the school. Elmer and Hannah split up, and Hannah drives off with a bunch of her classmates. However, during the ride, we find out through the radio that the epicenter of the abnormal occurrence was in Schweinfurt. The place Hannah's mother currently is. That's bad. Yet, thankfully, her little brother is already at home, so at least there's someone there to protect him. That's good. Elmer also packs his things and tries to take his dad's car, but can't find the keys. 
That's bad. Meanwhile, Hannah receives a call from her mother in Schweinfurt telling her to flee to her aunt in Hamburg by using one of the emergency trains. However, the connection suddenly cuts out. Ooh, that's bad. Hannah decides to ride to the station with her brother by bike, and, as you would imagine, her brother acts like an annoying little bastard. <sighs> Let's just hope he's not in the entire movie. The two reach a town where the road has been blocked when Hannah notices how bad the situation has become. <laughs> Holy shit! This movie just killed a dog. This movie has balls. A panic then ensues at the roadblock when the titular cloud draws closer. <coughs> While riding through the countryside, her brother again complains about being hot and thirsty. Hannah tries to comfort him by saying it's not very far to the next village. However, several cars come from behind and, well... Holy shit! This movie has some balls. Not only do we have a dead dog, now we have a dead kid. And make no mistake about it, it's not like, oh, he's just very severely injured, but he'll make it out alright. No, this kid is dead. She then gets picked up by a family, the father of which lays her brother to rest in a nearby cornfield. They get to the train station mentioned by Hannah's mom, where all hell breaks loose as everyone tries to get into the last train leaving. This leads to the children getting separated. Hannah takes care of them, but soon finds Elmer in the crowd. She tries to rush over to him, but loses the children in the process. Naturally, this doesn't sit well with the parents, who then yell at her, and on top of that, she loses Elmer in the commotion that ensues as the train leaves. So, with her brother gone, her boyfriend gone, and having failed to save the kids, Hannah decides to commit suicide by going out of the station and exposing herself to the radiation. So, does that mean the movie is over? Weird, because I thought this thing had a running time of 90 minutes. And we're only an hour in. Well, actually, no. Actually, we do still have a good while till this movie finally ends. In fact, after this scene, we find out that Hannah is now in the hospital, where we meet two new characters. Her bad neighbor Aisha, played by Claire Oelkers, and her caretaker Hannes, played by Thomas Blaschaya. And yes, this is the guy that plays the soldier as well as the head of the Order of the Many-Faced Gods in Game of Thrones. Anyway, we find out that the area around the plant has been divided into three zones. Zones 1, 2, and 3. We also find out that lists of missing people have been made and compiled, which prompts Hannah to ask Hannes to add her mom to the list. We also see what the radiation has done to Hannah as she starts losing all her hair. However, there is light in all this darkness, so to speak. Turns out that Elmer has found out where Hannah is and has come to see her. He gets into the fight with the authorities, but since he's 18, he's allowed to stay at his own risk. We then get a few nice scenes of the two together, a tender scene where she allows him to touch her bald head, and a scene with the two together on the roof. Yet, the uplifting bright moments are soon interrupted when Hannah's Aunt Helga, played by Gabriele Maria Schmeider, appears at the hospital. 
Hannah immediately asks about her mom. However, we find out that her mom has died. Holy shit! This movie has some balls. Not only do we have a dead dog and a dead kid, now we have a dead mom. I'd say the trinity of awful is thus complete. Now, it goes without saying that I don't condone the killing of moms, dogs, or kids. But, I mean, come on. We've all seen the generic disaster movies in which one or all of the aforementioned groups survive, even though it's completely unrealistic and it would never happen that way in real life. So kudos to the cloud for actually having some frigging balls in this respect. So after this bummer, Elmer decides to cheer Hannah up by putting on some music and the two start dancing together. However, the dance is interrupted by Elmer's father, played by Richie Miller, who wants him to come back with him. Elmer wants to stay with Hannah, but she thinks it's best if he goes with his dad. Hannah then moves to her Aunt Helga, where she goes back to school. She also meets Elmer, and after a little back and forth, he tells her that she can meet him at Hamburgstown Square. Hannah agrees to this, and as the two meet, we find out that Zone 3 has been reopened. So, this means she can go home, right? Not quite. At the pier, the two talk about Hannah's dead brother before the two decide to... head it off? Okay, two things here. First of all, in The Fisher and His Wife, we had Otto hitting on Ida by talking about bacteria, and now it's a dead kid? And secondly, don't you think it's a little bit risky for your health if you start sleeping with someone who's been under the effects of radiation? Either way, Elmer decides to confront his father with this, and we find out that his dad actually does give a damn about his kid. Elmer then tells Hannah that he's going off to the U.S. where his mom lives. Of course, this is just a cover-up as he actually delivers himself into the same clinic that Hannah was in. And how do we find out about that? Well, it's Aisha's birthday and Hannah decides to give her a present. And while talking, Aisha accidentally tells Hannah that Elmer is here also. Oops. She finds her boyfriend on the roof, and in a very emotional scene, she manages to stop him from committing suicide. In fact, this movie does have a number of very well-timed and very well-acted emotional moments. The last of which is the scene in which Elmer and Hannah drive out to the spot where her little brother was killed. They find his decomposed corpse in the field the father laid him in, and then bury him. So... This was Die Wolke, The Cloud, and it's a damn good movie. In fact, I'd consider it to be the best in the series of films I'm currently reviewing. And yes, I didn't watch the movies in the order that they appear in the series, just for your information. Regardless of what you may think of the late 80s and or the environmental awareness movements of the day, it goes without saying that Die Wolke, The Cloud, is not only a well-made movie, but the destruction of the plant in Fukushima a few years back shows just how real the danger of such an event still is. In fact, this is one of the main reasons why this film was updated to present day instead of making it an 80s period piece. And in my opinion, that was a pretty smart move. So this was Das German Critic, and in the next episode of this series, we're going to take a look at an R-rated book that's marketed to a PG-13 audience. See you in the next episode.